What's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flix. 2020 is upon us bringing a slew of new horror movies and even the first weekend of the year brought us the next entry in the US grudge franchise that ended back in 2009. So after 10 years, how does the new grudge stack up? That's what we'll be looking at in this ending explained for the grudge, where we follow a new curse that infects the lives of several people that encounter it, pretty much resulting in everyone getting mercilessly slaughtered by ghosts. You know the drill. Right before this grudge hit theaters, reviews started hitting the the web, and pretty much all were in agreement that this was total garbage, full of boring characters and weak scares, which is absolutely true, but I honestly don't think it was quite as bad as it was made out to be. I mean, this wound up being one of the few unfortunate movies to get a rare F cinema score rating, and a paltry 17% on Rotten Tomatoes, like it is the worst of the worst. But I gotta say, last year's Black Christmas was a much more painful viewing experience than this. That shit definitely deserved an F. Maybe for the grudge, a D plus is more appropriate. So let's begin with a look at why the movie wound up being so unsuccessful in my opinion. First and foremost, at least for me, when it comes to the US grudge series, really only the first one is worth anything. The second one is pretty scattershot and the third one was straight up garbage. So already my expectations coming into the fourth were extremely low. Why would I expect for the new one to suddenly be good when the franchise as a whole has been hit or miss? Also this coming out in January, a notorious dumping ground for movies that couldn't swim in more competitive box office waters is enough of a red flag on its own that this is probably going to be a stinker. Otherwise, they would have come out with it at Halloween or something like that. I'd say, however, the biggest crime the new grudge has is feeling especially perfunctory. There's simply nothing new to warrant its existence. And this really could have come out like two years after the grudge three and would have been like, oh, they made another one of those? The wait is what makes this have any kind of expectation. Geez, 10 years later and they're making a new one, they must have come up with something good. No, not really. It's more like it's been long enough for people to kind of forget about the old ones and yet still capitalize on what little goodwill the franchise name still has in order to scrounge up some cash. It's really just more of the same stuff that was already tired by the third one. Reheated once again rather than anything new or different. There's literally no shaking up of the formula whatsoever. They had the chance to do something new but retreated to safety and familiarity. With a game cast led by Andrea Riseborough, a subdued John Cho, and a barely in it Lin Shay, they do their best with what little they have to work with. It's almost like the cast is simply too good to be squandering their time in a horror movie. Or at least this one. Now also bringing a much more cranked up gore factor than the earlier entries. It's all chopped off fingers, maggot covered dead bodies that definitely elicited some serious reactions in the theaters. The pieces are there to make a worthy new addition to the series. But the whole been there, done that aspect is too powerful. Another big aspect has to do with how the story is told. For whatever reason, the filmmakers stick with the jumping around in time and set of characters format the first two films utilized, but where the first and to some extent the second used the format to increase the mystery and tension of the story, here it has the opposite effect. In the present story, when our detective discovers Lin Shay's husband's dead body and she's already totally batshit and cut off her own fingers, there's no question of what happened. She killed him. Yet we end up still having to sit through their own flashback story and learn how they encountered the curse, inevitably leading back to that moment. But we already know what happened, so we're basically just checking our watches until things slowly march towards what we already know is going to happen. And this permeates through the entire movie. Oh, real estate agent John Cho has to visit the house to get some signatures. Wonder what's going to happen. Yeah, he kills his family and himself. It's literally the same fatalistic setup we've had three times before. You can't stop the grudge, you die, that's it. And it appears that all these troubling factors work together to deliver a disappointing cinema experience. Like I said, it wasn't quite as bad as I would have thought based on the reviews. Now let's move on to the movie itself, breaking down the latest grudge victim stories all about the new curse, how things tie back to the original trilogy, and explaining the ending. Oddly, our story is set concurrently with the events of the original trilogy, opening in Tokyo in 2004 during the time frame of the first film. In fact, almost right before the setting of Karen's story. Outside the cursed Saiki house, a haunted looking Fiona makes a call to Yoko, who if we remember was the very 
first victim of Kayako in the 2004 grudge. Fiona seems concerned, feeling something is off, and apologizes for leaving, but is adamant she has to return home to the States. And of course, we know why, by entering the cursed house, those evil spirits are now attached to her, or at least Kayako, seen ominously standing over her shoulder while on the phone. She makes it back home to Pennsylvania, reuniting with her husband and daughter, but of course, we know what happens next. The curse is still attached to her, and Kayako eventually drives her to violence, causing her to kill her husband and drown her daughter just like poor Toshio, then ultimately taking her own life. As a result, a new curse is born at the Lander's home, which naturally over time claims more victims, anyone unlucky enough to set foot in the house. But also, there's a lot weird about this already. Like what the heck was Fiona doing in Tokyo acting as a nursing student in the first place? Karen and Yoko were both younger, but Fiona has a family back home and is clearly older than they were supposed to be. So what the heck was she doing in Japan without her family? Hey, husband and daughter, totally random, but I'm going to live my dream of being a nursing student across the ocean and leave you both behind. It's totally normal. Later, suckas. It's like they felt obligated to connect things directly to the first one, but it would have been much easier story-wise to just pick up with the Chicago curse left after the Grudge 3. And this brief appearance is also literally our only one by Kayako in the entire movie, which feels like a mistake as well. So now it's the Lander's family filling the same vengeful spirit roles, and they're simply not as frightening in appearance or demeanor as Kayako. Now they're more like standard possessed monsters instead of anything unique whatsoever. Why even call it the grudge if you're not gonna have Kayako? It's like the whole thing. And literally everybody croaks now, even if their necks were broken or not when they got killed. It's like why keep the same characteristics and killing style as Kayako, like bathtub drowning and hands coming out of your head in the shower. Seriously, stay away from washing up when these ghosts are around, but not actually utilize her further than a cameo. I don't know, it's a really odd choice. Oh well, continuing on. After our opening, we meet our groups of characters each in a different time between 2004 and 2006 that inevitably become claimed by the new curse. There's married real estate agents Peter and Nina Spencer who are also pregnant with their first child, which they are given unfortunate news about. Their unborn child potentially has old, which often results in their death after a few years, which is pretty heartbreaking. And it seems that death surrounds everyone in the movie even before entering the murder house. It's like, geez, these people are better off dead. Just kill them already. This bleakness could be another reason that people found the movie problematic. Everything is pretty dang dour the entire time. Then in 2005, we have the couple that moved into the house after the Larsons, who guess what, are also doomed by the house as we soon see. And then our most major plot occurring in 2006, following Detective Muldoon, who has plopped right into a case surrounding the cursed house. By the way, her husband recently passed and she's moved to this town for a fresh start, getting paired up with Detective Goodman. And yep, his mom just died. Oh, and his former partner, possibly dead too, but we'll get to that in a moment. Let's head back to 2004, where after the Landers family has become bad ghosts, it appears they were already hoping to sell the house before things turn murdery, as Peter swings by to get some signatures to do so. Getting no answer at the door, he foolishly enters the house, and finding no one is there, decides to come back later. But of course he's cursed now, and after visiting again, meeting little Melinda, who pretends to be home alone for a while, Peter seeing the Larson family ghost everywhere, before finally turning violent, taking a pair of scissors to his wife, and drowning himself in the tub. Well that's sad, I guess. I guess their kid ain't gonna die, but it's already dead. Uh, okay, great. The curse then moves on to the next inhabitants, the Mathesons, which connects us back to the present story with Muldoon in 2006, as she slowly uncovers what is really going on at their house. The trail begins when she and Goodman get word of a torched body found in a crashed car, having been hidden by the inclement weather for the entire winter. The woman, Lorna Moody, a semi-celebrity of sorts, was known for helping many people with assisted suicides, including the apparently at death's door, Faith, and Moody was hired by her husband, and she brings them back to the Mathesons. Trying to bring this up to Goodman, he seems reluctant to let her investigate any further, but she does so on her own anyway. Getting no answer at the door as usual, lousy, ungracious ghost host, she steps inside. Whoops, bad move, Muldoon, you've been grudged. She comes across Faith, who is in a state of complete mental break, screaming insanely and seeing she's severed off her own fingers. If that wasn't enough cause for concern, her husband's maggot-covered body is sat in an armchair in the living room. We come to learn the full story of the Mathesons. Mr. Matheson hired Moody to help his wife pass on, as on the surface, she seems to have lost touch with reality, talking to an imaginary person. But she's obviously just made friends with Melinda's spirit, though it's understandable he is concerned and have hired her to end his wife's suffering. Of course, the ghosts eventually scare her off and cause the crash that killed her, and the curse makes Faith turn on her husband. In 2006, they do at least get Faith to a hospital, but the inevitable occurs, Faith taking her own life
wife by leaping off a stairwell. Walden, with increased concern, tries to discuss the odd case with Goodman. Eventually loosening his tongue about his previous partner, Detective Wilson, that was tasked with investigating the initial Landers murders. While Goodman always felt too uneasy to set foot inside, Wilson did, and as expected, was driven nuts by the spirit's ever-increasing presence. Eventually, in a desperate bid to put an end to things, he shot himself in the face after seeing Tara again bothering him at the car window. Poor bastard didn't even manage to kill himself, but survives, now with a disfigured face and locked up in a psych hospital for the rest of his days. At least this turmoil wasn't ultimately pointless, or actually it ends up being pointless in a way. Muldoon pays him a visit, and he fills her in on what he's pieced together about the curse, including the Psyche family, even having had discussions with Detective Nakagawa in Tokyo, the detective that worked with Karen back in 2004, and the all-important point that the curse is attached to the house where the deaths occurred. And to try to keep the monsters away, Wilson takes extreme measures when seeing the spirits again, ripping his eyeballs out so that he can't see them, which doesn't actually work either, and he still gets off even with no eyes. Armed with the new truth about the curse, Muldoon feels she has no choice, and just like many others before her, decides to try to burn the Landers residence and put a stop to this crummy curse once and for all. Even though we know that doesn't work, and the curse has already spread to at least the Spencer house. Anyway, the ghosts try to stop her, and she gets one of those time echo things like we've seen previously, seeing how they all murdered each other, and right before she's about to set the place on fire, her little son Billy or whatever, who she explicitly told to wait in the car, well, why even bring him to the house in the first place? He hasn't been in the house, so wouldn't he be, you know, safer literally anywhere else? <laughs> it's fine. She tells him to do as they always do when scared, to close their eyes and count to five. Muldoon is able to start the fire as intended, and when we jump forward to some time after the events, everything seems better than ever for the mother and son. But of course they're not. Getting an unusually peppy Billy ready for school, it's another parlor trick. Giving the boy a hug, the real Billy passes by down the hall, saying bye to his mom and walking out the door. It's that tricky Melinda again wearing a Billy suit, who attacks Muldoon, dragging her away as the movie ends. This ending, another nihilistic outcome where literally no one survives if they encounter that old grudge, which if you've seen any of the other movies, was probably pretty obvious from the very beginning. That might be the movie's biggest failing, it just didn't have anything new to do with the franchise. And like I said earlier, it could have easily been straight to video and called The Grudge 4 back in 2011 or something. It's just bland, and doesn't even deliver on what the grudge means to most people. Kayako! I mean, come on now. I understand wanting to move forward or switch up the villains, but then why have them continue to use Kayako's old bag of tricks without fail? If you're actually going to change things, then actually change them instead of only doing a visual overhaul. But guess what? The Landers family ghosts aren't frightening, especially the dad. The few times a portly dude in a flannel shirt start croaking for no reason, I'm like, yeah, that's not scary. Anyway, maybe if there are further grudge adventures, they'll figure out a way to actually shake the formula up for a change. Instead of just doing the same thing, but adding more gore. That'll only take you so far. And that F cinema score shows it doesn't go very far at all. As I've mentioned with some other movies reviewed, I'm kind of stumped with this one, because I feel like I could actually write a pretty decent grudge movie that would deliver on what longtime fans would want while also broadening the series. It honestly doesn't even sound that difficult to me. Even fine, you want it to connect back to the first one so bad? Sure, sounds good, but make sure that this actually has more impact overall. We've had these time echoes appear in several of the movies. Maybe have during the echo this time, Karen's spirit shows up in her loop and helps Muldoon stop the spirits? This would show there finally is a way to stop the grudge, at least the one at the Lander's house, since there are obviously more floating around out there. And this would leave Muldoon investigating how to stop the whole thing in potential future stories. This whole thing would have been quite simple, and would have at least added something new and different to the series mythology. See, it took me about five seconds to come up with that. So if anyone at Ghost House Productions wants to give me a shot to write Grudge 5, shoot me a tweet. Sam Ramy, let me know, I'm, I'm available. And with that, we have reached the conclusion of this look at the new Grudge. Unfortunately, it was a disappointment after so much time away. It ultimately looks like Kayako and her spirit buddies are better off resting in peace especially since really only the first one was any good in the first place. What did you guys think of the new grudge and its ending? Do you feel that F score was warranted? And where would you rank this in the series? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.